California True Crime is a podcast that sometimes deals with heinous acts of violence towards other individuals. This podcast may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to this episode of California True Crime. This is Sean, and I will be hosting tonight. With me tonight, just like every time, is Jessica and Charles. How are you two? Great. Me too. I'm excited. Good. In this week's episode, we are going to talk about five different murders that happened in Southern California. Like always, when doing the research to find a case I covered, this one I had never heard of, and this one was kind of a shock that I hadn't. It's weird how some stories stay in the spotlight for decades and some with national coverage just and the horror of it, they just seem to fade away. This case has been called either the San Gabriel Valley Killings or the Puente Hills Mall Murders. I will explain later why they have two different names. Have you heard of it? No, I actually hadn't. I had a little bit, but okay. not. Before, it definitely like, doesn't have the presence of a lot okay. of the other cases. Like before starting this where we're researching everything? Yeah, I think okay. I found it. Well, maybe not. I think I found it maybe looking for cases yeah, that's in certain so hard. places. That's where I get like confused now because it's like trying to find episodes to do. Had I heard of this before or not? But the info tonight uh, came a lot from the Los Angeles Times, other random newspapers, um, and the case file from the California Supreme Court. So even though this only took place over a couple of months, I'm going to give it to you chronologically how it happened and then backtrack here and there with backgrounds on the victims and suspects. Tonight we'll be talking about different areas about 20 miles east of Los Angeles and about 30 miles north of Anaheim, if that puts it into perspective. The area we will be starting with is Monrovia, California in 1991, which is right in this area. On the night of July 5th, 1991, Jose Avina, age 22, who was a construction worker from Norwalk, was driving to his girlfriend's house around 10 p.m. At the intersection of Walnut and Primrose Avenue, Jose was rear-ended by another car. He was driving a Candy Apple Red 1987 Mitsubishi truck that his brother had given him two years before. What I read is that he loved this truck. In the paper, it said he spent most of his paycheck to customize it and clean it every day. From what I gathered, it wasn't like a huge car accident, just a little bump, enough to pull over and do the whole exchange and whatnot. Before Jose could get out of the car, someone was at his window with a shotgun telling him to get out of the car. I don't know how long the exchange happened or if he even really had time to get out, but Avina was shot in the head with a shotgun. He was pulled out of his truck and left in the road. The truck was later discovered in Pomona, which is roughly 20 miles east of Monrovia. Missing from the truck was some stereo equipment, such as amps, that was worth about 800 at the time. The police believed at first that this was a gang killing because of the location, time, and brutality of the murder. In the Monrovia News Post... This was the second of three consecutive shootings in the area, and there was 15 homicides on this uh, July 4th weekend in the Los Angeles area. I also read that car thefts by gunpoint were up in this area at the time. Now we will jump ahead a month to the late night of August 3rd to the early morning of the 4th in 1991. The next area we're going to talk about is West Covina, and since we'll be coming back to this area, we want to give you a little background. So, Charles, I know you have a little background on this. Yeah, and uh, this actually was uh, part of the case that I got excited about because until recently I'd never heard of West Covina. And then I don't know if you're familiar with there's a TV show called um, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, which is takes place a large part in West Covina, and it's actually filmed there. And it is one of those shows that you can watch, and it really does look like California. So that's how I heard about it. And then when you were doing this case, so yes, I I have some information. Before you get to that, just since I just remembered talking about things that have been filmed there, most of Good Burger was filmed in West Covina. I did have that. I was super excited Uh, to read uh, that. That's like my, you know, that's like, I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, 
but I was very excited because I know how, how big a fan of you are of that movie. Oh, yes. Uh, West Covina is a city in Los Angeles County. It's located about 19 miles east of downtown Los Angeles uh, in the East San Gabriel Valley, and it's part of the greater Los, An- uh, greater Los Angeles area. The population for the city is about uh, 106,098 at the 2010 census. It is not part of the Inland Empire, though, which is kind of where I thought it was originally. Uh, I found it was interesting that West Covina was incorporated back in 1923 because the city of Covina, which obviously is right next door to West Covina, Covina had a sewage problem and was going to basically take the land the city started on and make a sewage pit there. And so the local residents in this rural area got together around uh, Benjamin Franklin Maxson Jr., who kind of organized everything. He got the people together, they incorporated, and he was elected the first mayor in 1923. And that's how West Covina came about. What I think is awesome about the story is they are very proud of that. That is on their on everything I could look up about the history of the area that is front and center. So it's it's a weird way to start a city, but it's kind of cool that it's still there. You know, they, they bring that up. It was rural, less than a 1,000 people uh, in the early part of the 30s and 40s. But like a lot of other places that we've talked about in California, after World War II, this has a huge, huge population explosion. It actually has a popula- population explosion of a 1,000%. It goes from... 5,000 people in 1950 to the, by 1960, it's um, 50,000 people are already living there. And it continues to steadily grow from there on out. Demographics, it's, it's actually um, largely Hispanic. It also uh, shows a large uh, Filipino community there that's uh, centered around the um, south side of the city. And politically, it skews uh, slightly Democrat, but um, their elected officials are almost 50, 50% um, Democrat and Republican. And the household income, and this shocked me because, again, I first heard about this from watching a TV show, and a lot of the TV show portrays it as a lower socio- socioeconomic area. But the average income is $81,000, which is almost $10,000 higher than the rest of the state. So um, I thought that was interesting. I'm wondering if that has anything to do that it's just in the Los Angeles area, that uh, it's just higher prices and everything there. Yeah, It seems like when we, we've talked about places like, well, like Merced and I won't say pass through towns, but well, when we went back and, and if you haven't listened to this, please go back and listen to our Thanksgiving episode on um, El Cajon. But El Cajon being a pocket community outside of San Diego, it does seem like when you look at their history and their city website and how they build things, it does seem like that. They are very proud of their shopping centers, which sounds odd, but a lot of their big construction, which brings a lot of business, is these um, malls and shopping centers throughout the area. So I, I kind of think that I look at West Covina as as a pocket community off of L.A. A, a few other just random things. Again, like we said, the Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is actually filmed there. Um, Good Burger was filmed there. Uh, it's mentioned in a song by a group called the Mountain Goats. Yeah. Um, I had never heard of the Mountain Goats. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, the song's called The Grey King and the Silver Flame Attunement. So I'd like to post, we'll burn, post that on our website. Uh, and also, uh, one of my personal favorite things, uh, comic books, actually. In 2017, X-Men comic book heroes Iceman and Kitty Pride actually rescued a young mutant from West Covina Mall. So on our website, we're going to post some stuff. Uh, again, I can't. I don't know why, but West Covina just captured me this last couple of weeks doing research. I have a few things that we're going to post on our CaliforniaTrueCrime.com website. Um, one of those I, th- I found really interesting. It is a look at West Covina area from prehistory to current times. And so they've collected some artifacts, uh, archaeological artifacts, primary source documents and things like that to kind of show you the range of people and lifestyles that have lived there. And then also, I found a list off of the crazytourist.com, which is a fan of the crazy ex-girlfriend, that has the 15 best things to do in West Covina. So if you're there, um, you should check it out. So now back at West Covina um, on August 3rd, around midnight, Augustine and Linda Ramirez were closing up their restaurant, The Magic Mushroom, which they owned and was located at 2100 South Valinda Avenue. It's a pretty rad name for a restaurant. I tried really hard to find any info on the 
the restaurant or Linda and Augustine, but I could really not find anything about them. That night, they both drove in separate cars. Augustine walked Linda to her car, which was parked in the alley behind the restaurant. She started her car and turned on the headlights, and when Augustine was about 15 feet away from her car, a car drove up to him and blocked his path. Augustine was talking to them, and Linda noticed that one of the guys had a shotgun pointed at her husband. Augustine must have gave them his wallet. Linda seeing this, I can only imagine her being scared and frantic, was trying to get out of the car when Augustine was shot in the stomach, and then the car drove away. He was rushed to the hospital but died from his injuries. From the ID channel show I watched called Wicked Attraction, Rebels with a Deadly Cause, Augustine's son was um, a paramedic at the hospital and was one of the first to try to save his father's life, but he was unsuccessful and later died of his injuries. The next morning, uh, five of Augustine's credit cards were found by a dumpster at Edgewood Middle School in West Covina. Now, only about a week later is when this crazy story happens to Eugene Valdez. Valdez, 55 years old, worked as a salesman from a car dealership in the city of industry. Now, the city of industry, or sometimes referred to as industry, which doesn't seem right to me. Where are you from? Industry. Like, you you should say city of industry. See, I think it makes more sense to say you are from industry, not the city of industry. Nobody says I'm from the city of Sacramento. Yeah, but it's not called that. It's not actually the title, the city of, of whatever. This one is actually called the city of industry, but... When I look at maps, it does just say industry. It just does not sound right to me. I think it's because we're used to hearing it. I wonder if that's it just it's ingrained. Yeah. I mean, there I have heard this place before, so maybe, but I've never heard it as industry. It's just a weird name to me. So, the city of industry is in the area that we're talking about, but what really fascinates me is that it has over 3,000 businesses. It employs 67,000 people. But according to the 2010 census, it only has 219 residents. Permanent residents? Like only? Yeah, like people that live there, there's only 219, but it says that it employs 67,000. It's just straight up, it's a business town. So it really is, it's kind of, it's the opposite of a lot of the other towns we've talked about where people live in the town but commute somewhere else for work. Yeah, it seems this like— This is the place that apparently everyone in the area is commuting to work. Yeah, and I just found that really fascinating that it's such a low population, but it's the city of industry. Yeah, because in, with 66,000 people or 67,000 people there, you still have all the drains on infrastructure, yeah. roads, traffic. You don't get the benefit of I live in a place with— you know, right, and very small. Population. I'm assuming that like property taxes and stuff are all paid for by the businesses, and it's not f- solely on 219 people who like run a giant city. I, I don't know. It could be. They might just be rich. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a the, literal name. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Which again makes more sense of why you would say, "I it, live in <laughs> industry, <laughs> yeah. not the city of industry." Okay. Yeah. They also do some film production here. Uh, The Puente Hills Mall is actually located in the city of industry, but we'll come back to that later. Um, Another thing I found interesting is that there is a fake McDonald's restaurant that they use only for filming movies and commercials. So if I'm watching a commercial. (laughs) Yeah, it's probably not the only one. No. Because there's 8 billion McDonald's. So they they would be like open 24 hours just filming for each commercial that they make. But I, yeah, I mean. It's just there for McDonald's commercials and movies. It's or yeah, commercials and movies. It says that's crazy. I would. That's that is odd. So back to Valdez on August 9th, about nine p.m. He left work in the city of industry and was driving home to, in his newly purchased 1983 Oldsmobile Cutlass to Victorville, where he lived. And Victorville was seventy miles away, so it was quite a drive. Um, After about 30 minutes, he got really tired, so he pulled into a restaurant parking lot in Chino, and Chino's on the way east. He turned off his car, locked the doors, and went to sleep. About two hours later, two men were tapping on his window with a sawed-off shotgun, pointing at him, telling him to open the car door. They forced him to lie down face-first in the back seat. 
One of the men sat on Valdez's legs while holding the shotgun to his neck. The other man got in the driver's seat. He chose a radio station to listen to and then started driving. While they drove, the man on top of Valdez threatened him several times that he was going to kill him, but the guy driving said, quote, don't do it, we can use the car. At some other point during the drive, the man on top of Valdez asked, quote, why are you going this way? And the driver responded, I can get there just as fast. Uh, the man also punched and spit on Valdez. Valdez gave the men his money, wallet, and credit cards, and his watch. About 30 minutes later, the car started driving somewhat up an incline into the mountains. The car stopped into a turnout near Morris Dam, which is about 10 miles north of West Covina. On the ID show, this place was well known to police as a body dump. One of the guys on the show said that they were going to Morris Dam about around this time in 91, about twice a month for a body. They all got out of the car, and Valdez noticed another car with them who had a woman driving it. The two men told Valdez to walk towards the edge of the turnout. This is where he steps over. It's, it's like a cliff right there, pretty steep. Not fully straight down, but an incline. Um, as he walked to the cliff, he heard one of the men say, quote, You shoot the motherfucker. Valdez, extremely scared that he was now going to die, just jumped off a cliff. Uh, when he did jump, he heard a clicking sound, which was the shotgun misfiring. He tumbled down the incline about 150 feet. He laid still for several minutes, and when he was pretty sure the people had left, he had climbed all the way back up and flagged someone down who took him, took him to a phone to call the police, all while suffering some pretty bad head trauma from this jump. Valdez's 1983 Oldsmobile Cutlass was found six days later in Baldwin Park, which is close to all this. The car was missing its front fenders, the front grille and bumper, the hood, a left rear taillight, battery, tire, car radio, and speaker covers. Now on August 14th, which is five days later, we are back in West Covina. Juan Rios and his fiancée Sonia Aguirre pulled up their car to the drive through ATM at a Security Pacific Bank in West Covina. As he put his card into to do a transaction, a man ran up to the car with a handgun and demanded he withdraw as much money as he could or he would be shot. At the same time, another man ran up to the passenger window and pointed a handgun at Sonia. He told her to give him her ring, which was her diamond engagement ring. She gave it to him. Rios tried a couple times to pull money out of the machine, but it wasn't working. Both of the men got into the backseat of the car. So now the man behind Rios held a gun to Rios's head and told him to drive to the front of the bank. There, he made Rios use the walk-up ATM and told him to pull out $200. He did, and when they got back to the car, the man who was sitting behind Rios is now taking over in the driver's seat, and Rios got in the back. Uh, Rios also gave him his watch, gold chain, and ring. The man in the back then asked the driver what they were going to do, and the driver said, I have a plan. They started to drive, and both men told Sonia and Juan that they are not going to get hurt because they are cooperating. Around the same time, a police car drove past them, and it kind of scared the men. They drove about three miles away, pulled over, and let both Juan and Sonia out of the car. The couple then walked to a nearby store and called the police. The police found the car the next morning, right across the street from the ATM in a shopping mall parking lot. The police were able to lift fingerprints from the driver's side door on the outside. Now, on August 18th, four days after this, around 9.30 p.m., Willie Sams, 41, went to the same Security Pacific Bank ATM that Juan and Sonia went to. He w had a busy weekend since his daughter had just gotten married. Willie had been married to his wife, Loretta, for 21 years, and he worked in the maintenance department uh, for the L.A. Unified School District. Just like last time, Willie was at the drive-up ATM, and the two men entered the car in the back seat. They pointed handguns at Willie and made him pull out $200 from the ATM. They then forced him to drive to another Security Pacific Bank and made Willie take out another $600. The men then took over the driving and drove to Edgewood Middle School in West Covina. This is the same school where police found Augustine Ramirez's credit cards. They forced Willie into a dumpster, 
by the baseball field, and both men shot him a total of seven times. Four shots entered the right side, and three shots entered his left side. Afterwards, the men took the radio out of Willie's car and left the car in the shopping center parking lot. Around 11 p.m., the police found Willie's body in the dumpster. At 1.07 a.m., $60 was withdrawn again from the bank account at an ATM. The next day, a man and a woman attempted to use Willie's credit card at a Miller's Outpost in El Monte. If you don't know Miller's Outpost, it later turned into Anchor Blue. You could, and I did, buy Genco jeans from there, if you don't know what those are. Very fashionable. Charles, do you know Miller's Outpost? Yes, I have fond memories of the Miller's Outpost in a in a mall that was close to where I grew up. I actually remember originally it really had the Wild West feel, like it was everything was kind of brown and the everything was had like a cowboy motifs and oh, okay. stuff. And bought, I did buy uh, a Levi jacket. Actually, I saved and scrimped for that black Levi jacket, one of the best jackets I've ever owned. Uh, it was a big deal, though. I mean, it was a really nice, big denim store in the mall. Yeah, it was a lot of denim. <laughs> yeah. My my friend Scott, I was talking to him about Miller's Outpost. It comes up a lot, I guess. Um, he remembers, which now with the, the cowboy motif, this might, I don't remember it, but he said there was a train, like a little model train that went around it inside. I still don't remember it. but I, I don't remember that one. But Scott, thanks for the information. Getting back to the story, so they tried to buy $700 worth of clothing at Miller's Outpost. When the card was denied, since Willie's card had already been canceled, uh, the man and woman just ran out of the store. The store clerk kind of ran after them and wrote down the license plate number. The plate came back to a 1978 Mercury that was registered to an address in Baldwin, Baldwin Park which the 1978 Mercury was the same kind of car that the store clerk saw. The cops staked out the address in Baldwin Park, but nothing really came out of it. Now back to Willie's car. It was found the next day in a parking lot where the men had left it. They lifted prints from the car on uh, papers found in the car. I'm JDC053, a confused clone without any pants. Um, uh, I'm James Not a Cop, who is definitely not a cop. I'm Tobias Clutterbuck, a terrible Victorian actor. I'm Action 6 news reporter Chet Cleveland. I'm star of the stage Helen Slaymaker. And I'm Lieutenant Starburst Cheese It Taco Bell Esquire, the third. And this is Rolling Misadventures, a podcast that's part tabletop real play, part improvised audio drama. And a complete and total fiasco. Join us every two weeks for stories of mayhem, murder, and occasionally a moose. So check out Rolling Misadventures and see how it all goes wrong at rollingmisadventures.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Dick beans. So we are now going to get into the abductions that gave the name the Puente Hills Mall Murders. Uh, Like I said this earlier, it's in the city of industry or industry. But Jessica has some history of the mall because it's pretty fascinating. So the history of the Puente Hills Mall is interesting, especially because of the psychological dynamics involved in this case. And it seems they'll seem connected later when you talk about it, connected to the shopping center. The Puente Hills Mall was constructed in 1974, right at the height of the mall in America. Because people moved out of cities to suburban areas at a rapid pace, people needed something that would serve both as a place to shop, but also like a town center. Malls obviously have stores, but they also serve in the 80s and 90s as places of important social interaction. According to an article in Forbes magazine called Shopping Malls Aren't Dying, They're Evolving, By 1975, America had 30,000 malls and accounted for 50% of all retail dollars being spent. Wow. Malls were, especially in the 90s, a place where where teens would hang out. You've probably heard the term mall rat or even seen the movie. And this is because teens need a place to go socially, and malls often have more than just stores. But also because in 1990, malls, according to an NPR article called Teens and Mall Culture, employed about 3 million 16 to 19-year-olds. There's also a sense that malls are safe. People are dropping their children off. They're going to see their friends. 
And this is all because the inventor of the mall, Victor Gruen, wanted them to be more than stores. They were meant to be community centers or oasis in the suburbs. Yes, there are stores there, but there's also food, entertainment, places for kids to play. I know the mall that's near us when we were growing up had a big playground area. It also had Tilt, which was an arcade that was carpeted with like red carpet on the walls. And it was just filled with smoke all the time from everyone smoking and playing Street (laughs) Fighter. So it was pretty awesome. So whether the idea of a mall ended up being successful, they're just more than places to shop, especially during this time that these crimes take place. And there are several famous true crime stories that take place in malls and, you know, some kidnappings and things like that. But in general, I couldn't find any statistics that would point to malls being dangerous places. The Puente Hills Mall follows that same logic. When it opened, it had stores you'd expect. It had JCPenney's, Sears, a store owned by Macy's that I had never heard of called The Broadway, which I guess is just a Los Angeles or a Southern California thing. But eventually it would come to have a huge movie theater, fitness centers, restaurants, a bowling alley and an arcade. I had a Circuit City, which I only mentioned because they're gone now. In 1990, it also had a merry-go-round. So it's a mall, but it's really a lot more than that. It also had air conditioning, which is no joke here in California. Yeah. Other, and there are a lot of malls, like Charles was saying earlier, in the area. When I researched just malls in this area, at least in other cities kind of close to it, at least 10 other very large malls or shopping centers showed up. So I think it's probably a place that was really important or still is to this area. Yeah. Also, uh, part of the movie Back to the Future was filmed at the mall as well. I tried to find articles from the newspaper about the filming so we could put some stuff up, but I, I really couldn't. So if anyone has any pics of that or their time at this mall, just in general, they can send them our way. We'll also have links to a blog called Los Angeles Revisited, which has even more in-depth history of the Puente Hills Mall from when it's built ground up. I just want to throw in there that the very first Foot Locker ever opened at the Puente Hills Mall. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Also, if anyone cares and would like to learn more about malls or Victor Gruen, uh, I started a new podcast called The History of Malls. You can find it on all the different places, Spotify or iTunes and everything like that. But on the first episode, I actually give a little more history of Victor Gruen and the first mall that he built. So if you'd like to check it out, go ahead. It's The History of Malls. Now, on August 24th, which is six days after Willie Sams was August 18th, Neil and Elizabeth Nisbet drove to the mall around 1130 a.m., Neil went into the mall to do some things while Elizabeth waited in their 1990 Ford Bronco. Elizabeth was a secretary from an emergency unit at, the, at Martin Luther Hospital in Anaheim and was also studying to become a nurse. In November, Elizabeth and Neil would be married for 30 years and their daughter was also getting married that same month. Elizabeth has been very busy preparing and helping with the wedding. Neil was only in the mall for about 10 minutes. When he came out, both his wife and car were gone. He was really confused and searched for her for a couple hours and then finally called the police. While Neil was in the mall, a man and woman got into the Bronco and pulled a gun on Elizabeth. Elizabeth was bound on her hands and feet with duct tape. They put her in the backseat floorboard and covered her with a blanket. The man drove to the Covina branch of the First Interstate Bank, where both man and the woman went to the ATM and withdrew $400 while Elizabeth was in the car. They then drove to a liquor store where they pulled out another 100 Then they drove north on the 605 freeway and stopped on the side of the freeway. Another car stopped with them. After stopping, Elizabeth was shot and killed in the Bronco, and the man and woman left getting into the other car. They took many items of jewelry that Elizabeth was wearing. About 3.10 p.m., the CHP found the car parked on the freeway. Uh, Elizabeth was found under a blanket on the rear floorboard of of the car. The police were able to get fingerprints from the car and on ATM slips that were found in the car. Next, only three days later, on August 27th, After the murder of Elizabeth, we have another abduction from the Puente Hills Mall. So that's two, just from the same area. Shirley Denogen, 56, was an executive assistant to the president of a golf equipment supply company. In between 12.15 p.m. and 1 p.m., Shirley went to the mall to do some things. She even let her coworkers know she was running to the mall. She parked her Mercedes-Benz, went into the mall for about 20 minutes. 
After she was getting in the car, a man with a handgun forced his way in also. There was also two others with him, a man and a woman. These two bound Shirley's hands with some plastic ties in front of her body. They drove her to the first interstate bank in the city of industry. While she was in the car, they withdrew $400 at an ATM from her account. They went to another bank, and this time another woman who was following them in a different car used her card and withdrew another $100. After this, they drove to other banks but were not able to get any more money out. After these attempts, they got on the Pomona Freeway heading west. On the freeway, they pulled over on the side in between the Rosemead exit and the San Gabriel Boulevard exit. At this time, the woman in the other car was still following and pulled over also. At this point, the driver made Shirley get out and walk down to the embankment to an area with bushes and a chain link fence. Shirley had gunshot wounds in her left hand and both legs. In addition, she was shot twice in the head at close range. Um, I'm not really sure how many shots in all, but this was the information I had. Everyone drove off with both cars. Someone heard the gunshots and called the police, and they found Shirley shortly after that. The next day at 12.04 a.m., so barely the next day, but another 220 was taken out from Shirley's bank account at an ATM in a convenience store. Later this day, Shirley's car was found in El Monte. Like the other murders and kidnappings, the police found fingerprints on the car and paper from ATM slips. So that was a lot of information, a lot of stuff. I, I kind of want to just do a, a quick recap and just so we can go over this again. The first murder of Jose Vina was on July 5th, and it happened in Monrovia. Next, we jump all the way a month uh, to the murder of Augustine Ramirez at the parking lot of the Magic Mushroom in West Covina. Then we have the kidnapping, robbery, and attempted murder of Eugene Valdez. He was parked in his car sleeping in Chino, but then was taken to the Morris Dam. Then we're back to West Covina for the robbery of Juan and Sonia and the murder of Willie Sams. Then we move into the city of industry at the Puente Hills Malls for the murder of Elizabeth Nesbitt and Shirley Denogen. And that last murder took place August 27th. These areas, they're all east of L.A. um, that make up the story. And looking at a map, it kind of focuses around West Covina as like the central hub. Monrovia is a little northwest of it. Uh, City of industry is south. Chino is east. Morris Dam is north, and then a couple other places that we mentioned are all around here. The whole entire span of these heinous crimes was 54 days, which isn't that much. But if, you're, if you leave out Jose Avina, which was a month before, all this last stuff, it only took 24 days for all that stuff to happen. And that's just a short amount of time for how much damage was done. So with all of these murders, and it's really terrifying and awful... Are people in these areas kind of freaking out? They are, but they're more, they're mainly freaking out because of the mall murders. They're not even really associating the other things that happened at the time, except these two mall murders that happened within three days of each other. That kind of connects to what you were talking about as far as, and I think something we all experienced now when we go to a mall or even when we were kids hanging out at them, but that idea that the mall is a place of community interaction and that. It's a place that parents drop their kids off and you have a certain amount of a feeling of safety at a mall, whether it's real or imagined, and then to have these violent acts. Yeah, I actually saw a news segment where a woman was talking about how she works the late shift at the bank and the bank was giving them uh, pepper spray and ramping up security. In the uh, news thing, she actually said tear gas, but she had the little container mm-hmm. that looked like pepper spray. I think it just put everyone in limbo about what to do. In an article from the Los Angeles Times on August 30th, which was three days after the last murder, most seem scared, but um, a lady named Winona Gordon said, quote, it's daylight and I'm an optimist and I always think it's going to happen to the other person, end quote. So she, she seemed okay. And the two murders happened in the daylight hours though, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. And she, but she's there three days after the second one. Now, with the last murder, the cops get a break in the case. This is 
beginning, you know, this is 1991. Technology was just kind of getting started on how we know it today. Um, ATMs started getting cameras on them, but they were not as effective as today. I think they didn't take them f- the pictures frequently, and uh, they'd be just super grainy, black and white. On one of the ATMs that they captured two of the suspects withdrawing money, and in the background, you can actually see the last victim, Shirley, still sitting in her car. The pictures were enhanced on a computer and made bigger to pass around. Uh, They passed the pictures around, but no one was really recognizing them. The police decided to stop by West Covina Police Station and see if anyone would know the suspects. So as they show the photos and the suspects, and they were uh, passing around the 1978 tan mercury from Miller's outpost that came back on the plates. The police office, a police officer named Marty Sevilla said he knew of the tan mercury belonging to some quote troublemakers at the Woodside apartments in West Covina where he patrolled. He also informed them that some gang detail officers might know the suspects names. The gang detail officers indeed knew their names and their actual address. I'm going to, a little side note here, I'm going to read a paragraph from the Los Angeles Times article from September 23rd in 1991, just because I found it a little wrong. So it's talking about all the detectives getting together and um, pooling all the evidence. At, at this time, they're feeling that the Willie Sams murder is also connected to these two, the, at least the detectives are, because of just the very same mood, motives and everything like that. But the paragraph says, quote, Although veteran detectives learned not to let their cases get to them, these murders were different. These were pure victims, Sergeant Lee said, not the prostitute out walking at 3 a.m. or the surfer hitchhiking. This is all of us. All of us have ATM cards. All of us go to the malls, end quote. I just, reading this, I'm, he's just, it seems like he's saying surfers and sex workers, they're not allowed to have bank accounts or go to the malls. and that I'm like his tone. It's like that surfer had it coming, you know, kind of thing. It, it, and to use the word pure victims, then mention these two people that aren't a part, part of it, a, a classification of people just seemed wrong. Yeah. It's almost like saying that, that these victims, we need to do better by these victims because they weren't disposable. Like you said, a sex worker working at 3 a.m., isn't looking to get killed right somehow are so are you saying that somehow that person's asking for it or or a, a kid or a surfer hitchhiking again you go out hitchhiking you're not looking to get murdered right. nobody's doing that and to use these were pure victims and right. then you know it's just it but and again not to excuse it but i think i i know it still goes on now because we've talked about it too on on cases that are a lot closer to our own time but I think people are a lot more savvy or trying to be more savvy of that in the in the newspapers and, and t- television. It might be a case of, you know, detectives talking or saying something before he was actually thinking. Right. And or you take it out of context or. I couldn't find much more on Sergeant Lee who said this. I, I do know that in that Wicked Attractions ID show, he was the retired police person that was like taking you around like the narrator in a way and i think too not just and maybe speaking from his own personal point of view of the idea of because i can't imagine having to to investigate these crimes and then being confronted with uh, a victim that hits so close to home well we talked about this in the steven stanner cases with jeff uh, reinick's book when he in his book he talks about victims that remind him of his own children Mm -hmm. and having that much more impact and so i wonder if that if that quote as mishandled and terrible as it is comes from a place of this person is somebody that i can see me being connected to which doesn't make it better i'm not excusing that at all that's everyone deserves an investigation to try to solve what happened to them i think it's unfortunately something we all do in a way we've talked a lot about why certain cases get more press than others and there's probably a whole bunch of reasons why but sometimes it does feel like the people you can identify with get more press or get more notice than the people you just you can't because their lives are so different which is as we said we've always talked about that being wrong and trying to change that and thinking about it more i think 
knowing that that happens and confronting it as opposed to just accepting it. And I think for me, just reading this, you know, I know it, it's 91, but I felt like I was alive 91. I remember things. Right. And it's just, it, it's difficult to read mm-hmm. thinking about it now. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, who knows what I thought of if I actually read this article in 91. I was too young. But if I was my age then, you know, I never know. But I just, I found it very interesting that it was published also. And like, right. Yeah. You know. And then nobody, nobody said anything about it. Like it was just a, almost a throwaway quote. Yeah. Like, oh, obviously. So the police decide to sit on the apartment and do the old stakeout style with the, the information they got from the, the gang unit. At around 2.30 2 a.m. on August 30th, a woman left the apartment and got into a 1987 tan Mercury. They followed her to a jack-in-the-box, which wasn't far away. When she was leaving with the food, they arrested her. Now, others were still sitting at the apartment watching it, so with one in custody— They set up going in and arresting the rest. This happened uh, at 3.15 a.m. and caught the suspects off guard while they were sleeping and no one got hurt. Two of the men in the apartment reached for guns, but the SWAT team threw flash grenades and were able to get them before they could retrieve their weapons. Uh, There was also a six-year-old sleeping in the apartment at the time. I think we'll stop here for today and we'll pick back up with the rest of the story next time. Tonight's cold case comes from the LA Times article written by Jeanette Marantos. Oscar Andrew Garcia, an 18-year-old Latino, died April 23, 2017, after he was shot in the 100 block of West Cypress Avenue in Monrovia. Garcia had gone to the home of a female friend on Sunday evening with a male friend. The three students were talking in the garage about 11.36 p.m., when a man in his early 20s walked through the door and pointed a handgun at them. Some words were said, and then this unknown man opened fire. Garcia and his male friend were struck by gunfire. Garcia was pronounced dead at the scene at 12.07 a.m. from multiple gunshot wounds. Garcia's friend, however, survived his wounds. Garcia grew up in Monrovia. He played soccer at Canyon Oaks High School and loved to skateboard. After graduating high school, Garcia planned to attend Pasadena City College and study photography. The suspect was described as a light-skinned Latino male, about six feet tall and medium build, with brown eyes, black short hair, a goatee, and a black baseball-style cap with an unknown, unknown logo. Investigators are seeking help because they haven't been able to get any information about the shooter or possible motives. Anyone with information is asked to call the Sheriff's Homicide Bureau and ask for Sergeant Ken Perry or Detective Scott Matlock at area code 323-890-5500. Those wishing to remain anonymous should call Crime Stoppers at 800-222-8477. We'll be posting a link to this article on our California True Crime Cold Case Files. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime. If you have any questions or just want to talk with us, you can catch us on our Facebook page or on Instagram or Twitter at Cali True Crime. We appreciate a review on the listening platform of your choice. And if you'd like to support the show and our research for episodes, you can go to our Patreon page on our website at CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. Special thanks to our quality control manager, Melanie Duncan. This has been recorded at Chateau Walnut.